All right, so in Romans chapter 12, there's a lot of great content in this chapter, but we're going to be focusing in here on the, the beginning and, and the middle of this chapter. Um, I want you to notice right off from the beginning, and you're going to find verses like this throughout the Bible, of our expectations as Christians, right? What God expects of us, what are the commandments, what are the things that, that we ought to be doing? We, have, we live in a society that's a little bit too lackadaisical. The kind of, by and large, okay, not everybody, but by and large, the general feeling among Christians, among your average Christian is they go to church once a week and they feel, they sing a few songs and they feel like they get close to God and then they kind of forget everything and just go about their business for the whole rest of the week. And you have varying degrees of that. Some people like to come and put on a big show and they'll use all the spiritual language and, and how, how holy and wonderful they are and then they go out the rest of the week and they're, you know, a completely different person. And that's not how we ought to be. That's being a hypocrite. You know, whoever you are when you come into church today ought to be the same person that you are throughout the rest of the week. But what we see here is, look at verse number one. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying, I want you, you ought to present your bodies a living sacrifice where you are just saying, here I am, God. Do with me whatever you want. Let me, I want to be your servant. I am here as a living sacrifice. I am offering myself up to your will to do whatever it is that you want to do. Now, how many people truly have that type of an attitude when it comes to serving God? You say, well, that sounds really extreme. Yeah, it is extreme. And it, maybe you haven't read the Bible very much, but the Bible is very extreme when you compare it to today's world. But honestly, that's just in comparison to today's world. The Bible really isn't, I don't believe the Bible is extreme. It's just because we're comparing it to an extremely wicked world, an extremely wicked society, an extremely wicked people that don't want to have anything to do with God. So when you compare it among that, yeah, it looks very extreme. But that's why he says here, he says, you'll present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. He says, that's just reasonable. There's nothing above and beyond that he's asking here. He just says, you know what? That's pretty reasonable that you offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. Now, why would that be reasonable? Oh, maybe because Jesus Christ was whipped and beaten and bloodied and nailed to a cross and died and went to hell for three days and three nights to pay for your sins. Amen. Maybe that's why it's reasonable to just say, okay, God, thank you so much for saving my soul and that I didn't have to go through any of that stuff but that you've just given me grace and mercy and you love me and you've given me a free gift of eternal life. It's reasonable just to say, God, <laughs> I really don't have anything to give you because what you've given me is above price. It's invaluable. It, it, it's something that I can never attain on my own whatsoever. I had no hope whatsoever and you've just given it to me for free. So you know what's reasonable to me? Here I am, God. What do you want me to do? I love you. I love the fact that you saved me from all my sins, God. I want to serve you. That's reasonable. Now, that's the attitude that we ought to have. But unfortunately, what happens is, and look, this happens to everybody. So this is a sermon that, that will, will apply to everybody. Whether you think so or not, this sermon applies to you, it applies to me, it applies to everybody. And the title of my sermon this morning is called Going Through the Motions. Going Through the Motions. Way too often times, as Christians, we get in a rut. We get into a phase where we just kind of we're just doing some things. Now, let me start off by saying this. I think it's very good to have a routine. To make a routine based on your priorities. I think it's excellent. I think everybody should do that. I think you should decide, do I want to offer my body up as a living sacrifice to our Lord? Do I want to do that? If so, if the answer is yes, you know what? Yes, this is my desire. This is my will. I want to do this. I think that's a reasonable service to do this. How are you going to schedule out your life, your day? What things are you going to do in order to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be in compliance with offering myself as a living sacrifice? For example, if God is so important, are you going to put God first in your life? And say, Here I am, God, use me, but then not show up to church. Right? I mean, that's, just, that's a real obvious, simple example. But here's the thing. 
There are many people where the smallest thing comes up in their life and then they can't make, oh, I can't make it to church. Oh, I can't make it to church. You know, I can't make it to church for this reason. I can't make it to church for that reason. Oh, I, I woke up a little bit late. I can't make it to church. I do, you know, whatever. All of these different things. And it just like seems like one week after another after another, there's always an excuse not to come to church. Now look, I realize, especially in this church, we have people that can't make it because of health reasons or because they're taking care of other people. So you're like, I get it. Okay, and, and I'm not trying to make people feel bad about having legitimate problems that are keeping you from, you know, leaving your house and getting at, you know, whatever. Like, you're ill. You know, don't come to church when you're sick. <laughs> okay, you don't have to prove how spiritual you are by, like, coming with a little garbage can next to you so you could vomit during the church service, but you're here in church. No, 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 no. Have some respect for everybody else here and not pass on those diseases to everybody. We, nobody wants to be sick. Take care of yourself and come. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who, oh, the Home and Garden Expo is going on. And I've got some work to do at my house, so I'm going to go and check that out. I can't make it to church, right? So, but you know what? It's priorities. What's important to you? And hey, if you, if you want to do those things, go ahead and do it. But don't fool yourself and think that you are offering yourself up as a living sacrifice if that's your attitude when it, when it comes to things like coming to church. Or look at... Um, well, I'll get, I'll get into this a little bit. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I want you to look here at verse number 10 now of, of Romans 12 where we started because he's saying, look, it's your reasonable service to offer yourself up as a, as a, as a living sacrifice, offer up your bodies, and then he says, be not conformed to this world. Don't be like this world. Don't be patterned after this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to transform our lives. We are constantly trying to change our lives from being conformed to this world, which would be, it's Sunday afternoon. I'm going to do some housework. I'm going to go to the expo. I'm going to do all these other things as opposed to being transformed and saying, no, I'm not doing those things anymore. Now I'm going to serve God. Now I've got a different focus. Now I have a different goal. I have different things that are important to me. And I'm going to live my life and act out those things in a manner that is um, consistent with my belief. In verse number 10 here of Romans 12, he says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So there's, there's all these things. They say rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the Nessie of saints, giving hospitality. He goes on and on. These are all these things, right? If you're going to offer yourself a living sacrifice, all, read all of this whole chapter. Read the whole Bible. <laughs> get, get everything. But there's so many things here, I think individually, we could all work on as it stands. But I want to focus in on verse 11 there where he says, fervent in spirit. Because oftentimes what happens is we get to the point where, you know what, yes, I've decided church is important. Yes, I've decided reading my Bible is important. Yes, I've decided that, that God is important and he's number one in my life. But we end up getting to a point where we just are kind of going through the motions. Right? And I know all about this. I've already decided long ago, coming to church is important. And I said, you know what, I want to be there every time there's a service. So Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night are the services that my church had when I decided that that was important enough to me and I'm just going to go and I'm going to be there and I'm not going to let other things get in my way. If someone has a party, if someone has other things going on, I'm going to say, you know what, no, I've already got prior obligations. That was a decision that I made. You make the decision for yourself. But the decision I made is that. But what, what the, the problem is, is when we lack the fervency in our spirit, when we, when we, when we kind of get real dull, about serving God. And the Christian life, it's not a sprint. You're not always going to be on fire for God 24-7, although that would be great. That's what we should be striving for. You're going to have ups and downs as you do in your life. There's going to be times where you feel like you're doing great, man. You're on fire going out. You're winning souls. You're reading your Bible. You're doing everything great. And then there's going to be times where you kind of get a little stuck in a rut. And this is what I'm preaching about this morning is to help you get out. If you're in that rut, get out of that rut. And if you're not in that rut, to avoid getting in that rut. We need to have this fervency of spirit. And you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 122, verse number one says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Right? That's, that's David speaking. You know, I was glad. I was happy. Do you enjoy coming to church? Or is it something that you just feel like you have to do? If you feel like, well, I just got to put in my time. I'm just going to church because I know I need to go to church. 
Hey, praise the Lord that you're going to church because you know you need to go to church. I think that's great. And I think you ought to keep doing that. But we need to strive for something more. We need to have the right spirit where you say, you know what, I'm looking forward to seeing the Sigletus family. I'm looking forward to seeing that type of experience. I'm looking forward to seeing Joyce. I'm looking forward to seeing these people at church. Hey, praise the Lord. Tomorrow's Sunday. Let's go to church, man. I'm excited. I'm pumped. Let's do this. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. It shouldn't be a place that, for one, that you dread. Hopefully you don't dread coming to church going, I don't know what pastor's going to preach on this morning, man. He ripped on me last week. I don't know what, I don't know what he's going to be preaching this morning. I don't really want to go. We ought, that's not the attitude we ought to have. Because honestly, if you do have that attitude, think about it. It's, it's, now, if I were just preaching my own opinion, then I could see, yeah, why would you want to listen to that guy if it's just coming out of my own heart? But I don't think I'm doing that. I, I feel like I'm proving everything with Scripture. And if it's a sin and if it kind of stings a little bit, well, that's not, my, that's not a problem you have with me. It's a problem you have with God. And if we are going to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, we need to make sure that we are in line with God's Word and with what He wants for us. So let's look forward to the chastening. Let's look forward to the, to the ripping face and the rebuking and say, oh, Hey, this, they all, thus saith the Lord, this is sin. And let's get it out of our life. And let's keep moving forward. And not get stuck and move backward or not dread church or dread things like that. Church shouldn't be something that's just a checklist. Well, I did church today. I'm good till next week. Too many people have that type of an attitude. Let's be happy about this. Let's, let's be fervent. Let's, let's enjoy this. You know, we should enjoy the fellowship with each other. Enjoy singing the praises to God. Praise the Lord. How about prayer? Prayer is another aspect that you can be getting. And you know what? Maybe, you know, when you get in a rut, it may not be all of these things on this list. I'm going to bring up a few different points, but maybe it's just one of them, right? And this is something that we, we need to believe. I believe that all of these need to be checked on. It's easy to get complacent with your prayer life. For example, just as you have a schedule, say, you know what, I'm going to church on Sunday morning every week or Sunday morning, you know, all three services, whatever, whatever your schedule is, I'm doing it all the time. It can be easy to fall into the rut of just, well, I'm just doing this like a robot and just kind of going through the motions and I don't really care about being there. It's the same thing with prayer. For example, I pray before every meal that I eat. I give thanks unto the Lord, just praying for that. And oftentimes I'll use that time to pray for other things also. It's easy when you make a routine for yourself. And again, there's nothing wrong with routine. There's nothing wrong with habits. Just say, dear God, bless the food of my body in Jesus' name, amen. And then just start eating. Right? That's not a real prayer. And that's not what God's looking for. And that's being complacent and not caring and not thinking about what you're even doing and you're just going through the motions. And God, you know what, to get to God, you might as well just not even do that at all. Because it's insulting to just sit there and just, and just run through some little chant. Some little thing that you're not even thinking about. A prayer is something where you are praying to God with your heart. I mean, you are saying things that you mean. Now, a lot of times my prayers are, are very similar. You know, I mean, the, the words, you kind of get used to using, you know, asking for certain things, asking for God's blessings and things like that. That's okay. You don't have to always just be changing the words up, but it needs to be coming from your heart. Right. You need to be taking a step back. And I try to teach it with my children, you know, because they're always like, you know, we get to dinner and they sit down and are real hungry and say, look, no, we're going to wait a second. We're going to wait. We're going we're gonna to show some restraint over our bodies, over our flesh, over our gut. We're going to relax a little bit. We're going to pray. We're going to thank God. And we're going to pray from our hearts. Fervently. We're going to pray with the meaning, with the desire, with, with the intent that we know what we're talking to God and this is important. I mean, we look at Jesus Christ when he prayed unto God. He prayed fervently in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, he was sweating as it were, the Bible says, as a word drops of blood. He was so, I mean, and obviously he was facing a very serious situation in front of going to the cross and being crucified for our sins. But you look at the time that he spent. He took time. He set time apart. He would go off into a mountain to pray alone. He would say, you know what? I'm going to go pray now. There's all these people around. There's all this work to do. There's all the you know, people to teach and preach to and to heal and all the work that Jesus Christ would do. He said, you know what? No, now I'm going to take some time. I'm going to go pray. Make sure that you don't allow yourself to get too busy in your life to where prayers is out the window. 
Because it's important. Jesus thought it was if Jesus thought it was important to take an hour or two hours or half the night or however long it was, you see the recorder in the Bible of him spending time and praying. If he thought it was that important, I think we should think it's that important too. I mean, he's the one that said, Ask and you shall receive. You know, what father of the son asked him, you know, for an egg? Is he going to give him a serpent? You know, if, you, if, you, if, your, son, if your child asks you for food, you're not going to give him horrible, you know, something bad, something wicked. Well, if you ask God for good things, guess what? He's way better than any earthly father. He'll give it unto you. Prayer is powerful. That's why we go, that's why we even print and go over our prayer requests because they are important. Now, it may seem kind of redundant. Sometimes we have the same people on this list. Don't let yourself get complacent over it. Care about those people and care about God and care about the prayer time. The Bible says, turn if you would to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'll read for you from Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 4.12 reads, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Well, I like that verse because it's, he's talking about being fervent in his prayers. It's, it's, it's being fiery. It's, you know, it's, he's being, being genuine and being all into the praying. And he says, laboring fervently for you in prayers. Prayer can be a labor. Because depending on you know, when you do it, you know, a lot of times people will, will pray before bed, and, and I do this. You know, I go through a lot. I kind of run down and wind down and, and just go through my head all the people I want to pray for, all the things I want to pray for. And you need to make sure you stay awake. Honestly. I mean, it is because, I mean, I usually pray with my eyes closed. I don't always. I'm going to pray in my vehicle. I'm going to pray with my eyes open. That's not the point. You know, I mean, we kind of get into these rituals you don't have to close your eyes when you pray in order to talk to God. You don't have to do that. You don't have to bow your head in order to pray and, and talk to God. Now, we do that because it's a sign of humility. We're kind of humbling ourselves and just kind of putting our face down towards the ground when we pray. That's why we do that, in case you didn't know. Um, when I always say, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer, we're bowing ourselves and humbling ourselves before the Lord. There's a lot of people that get on their knees and pray, amen, praise the Lord, do that. Fall on your face and, and, and pray to God. Those are all great things to do. But you don't have to do any single one of those things in order to talk to God. We just talk to Him and pray to Him. But prayer can be a labor. You need to be able to put the time apart. You need to be able to keep your mind focused on what you're doing. It's easy for your mind to get kind of scatterbrained with all the things that are going on in your life. You start praying for somebody and then you start thinking about something else. Oh, wait, what am I doing? I'm praying. And look, it happens, okay? I'm not, I'm not, saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging you for, for, for that happening, but we need to just make sure that we're paying attention and we realize that and we're setting the time apart appropriately and taking it seriously. That it doesn't just become some little ritual, some little routine. Dear God, bless the food in my body, amen. You know, lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep it. If I die before I wake, I pray, you know, like those little stupid prayers that's just like meaningless. No, don't chant. Pray with your heart unto God. Matthew 6, Jesus Christ taught us, that's where you find the, the Lord's Prayer, right? Which is commonly used as a chant in the Catholic Church and in many other Protestant churches as well. I learned it growing up and it's something that we just chanted in church. And what's funny is that in Matthew 6, Jesus Christ says, don't use vain repetition as the heathen d does. And then he goes on to teach them the Lord's Prayer. So you don't be just chanting, you know, when you want to pray to God, don't chant the Lord's Prayer. That was just an example of how to pray. Use his example. And, and apply it to yourself and the things that you are asking for. You're in James chapter 5. Look at verse number 16. James 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Important. I love that he brings up this story. He says, look, the effectual, fervent prayer. You're staying on top of it. You are praying and praying and praying, and you are making sure that you are being diligent about your prayers. He says it avails much. It does a lot. Don't just think you're praying and speaking into the air. You're speaking to your heavenly Father and He hears you. Right. He's listening. Amen. It avails much. You say, oh, well, what are my words going to do? Well, what did God's words do? He created everything that we see here today. 
God's Word created everything. God's Word brings life. Our words can communicate to that same God that has that type of power. We're not just speaking into the air. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he brings up this story of Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He says, you know what? He was just a man. Now you could read these great stories of these heroes of the faith and these heroes of the Bible and you kind of could lift them up and be like, wow, what a great man. And you know what? Praise the Lord. Yeah, Elijah was a great man. Moses was a great man. But you know what? They were all just men. All of them. And I've been learning this and just kind of realizing this more in my life that there are people, you know what? They're just people. They're just human. You could look at someone and just be like, what? how do they get all this stuff done? How can they do it? I have no idea how they do it. You know what? They're just a man. They're just a person. They can do that. If they can do it, you can do it too. And he gives us the example of Elijah saying, he's just a man, just like you and me, subject to the same passions we are, yet he was able to pray unto God and he made it so it didn't rain for three years and six months because of his prayer. And it's clear to say it is because he was praying unto God for that. And then he prayed again and it rained. It's great power in prayer. And that's real. That's reality. And you know what? God is still the same. We need to keep that in mind and remember when you're praying so that you don't just become complacent about it. Remember, hey, God's the God that can cause it not to rain for three and a half years if I pray and ask Him for it. But we have to pray believing, having the faith, knowing that we serve a God that listens to our prayers and know that when you take the time apart and care for someone else and pray for them, that God will listen to you. And he answers our prayers according to his will. Don't get complacent in these things. Don't just always be falling asleep every time you pray. Make sure that you, if, you know, if that's the case, you need to change something. If you're getting into a rut of, of just always chanting the same thing, change something. Do something different. For example, if you pray before you go to bed like I do, don't get yourself all real comfortable laying on, if you have a problem falling asleep. Don't get yourself all real comfortable laying on your bed and closing your eyes and just, I mean, basically getting ready for sleep while you're praying if you're always falling asleep during prayer. Say, you know what? No, before I do that, I'm going to sit up. I'm going to prop myself, you know, do something to where you're still staying awake. And it could be anything. I mean, getting on your knees is a good way because you're probably not going to fall asleep on your knees. It's not that comfortable. Now, if you can't do that, think of just do something else. You know, there's so many different ways that you can, you can pray because you don't have to be in any particular position in order to pray. Just make sure you're not in a position where you're going to be ready to, to fall asleep. How about reading your Bible? Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would, to Psalm 126. Again, reading, you know, Bible reading. I think it's very important. The Bible says that, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, ma every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And we see over and over again the... the uh, equation of manna with the word of God and just as the children of Israel needed that manna to physically sustain them every day that they were in the wilderness God provided that for them they ate every single day well the manna is likened to the word of God we ought to be getting into the word of God and reading God's word every day for our spiritual sustenance in order to maintain ourselves in order to be healthy as a Christian keep reading and again, it's another thing we could fall into a rut on. And we just kind of go through the motions. Well, I do this. And you just kind of, well, I just got to get my reading done. And you just kind of skim through, okay. And you just pull out your little daily devotional. You read like a couple verses, and that's it. That is not offering yourself up as a living sacrifice. That is not serving the Lord the way that, the way that He's intended to. If all you do is just read a psalm or read a little thing every day, are you really offering yourself, your body up as a sacrifice? I really think that that is acceptable. Now look, you're going to say, yeah, but there's all these things you're mentioning. It's a lot of work. Yes, it is. That's why you're offering your whole body up as a living sacrifice. Like, here's my whole thing. Here's everything I have to do, God. What do you want me to do? Hebrews 2.1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So when you're reading, take heed to what you're reading. Absorb it and take the time to do so. It's easy to read and again, have your mind distracted on other things. You could read, and you could read entire chapters. I've done this before. And you're like, what did I just read? 
but make sure that you care enough about the getting the reading in that you don't just say, well, I did, my, I did my chapters anyways, I'm done. Go back and read it. I mean, absorb, get, it, get the learning. Get, you'll receive the nutrition from God through His Word when that happens. Because it's going to happen. It's bound to. It happens to everybody. But make sure you are diligent enough and fervent enough in your spirit to say, you know what? No, I need to go back and read this all over again and pay attention this time. Because I care about it, because I want to take heed to the things which I've heard from God, less than any time I let them slip. You say, if you're not paying attention, you're going to slip. You're going to slip up. You're going to be making mistakes. You're going to be thinking, you're not going to, you're not going to remember the things that you just read because you just skimmed over it. Let's read these things and apply them, and let's get in our word and hear from God. See, when we pray to God, we're talking to God. But you know what? He's not audibly answering us back when we pray to God. We hear from God through His Word. God's not going to open up and start talking to you and you have a conversation with Him. You know, if you start having, hearing voices like that, <laughs> you might want to seriously get yourself checked out because that's not how God operates anymore. God spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Is it in diverse manners? He used visions and dreams and He used audible voices, but... He's given us His Word. It's complete. We don't, we don't need any new revelations from God. We have, we have revelation. It's at the end of the Bible. It's the last book. It's complete. This is how we hear from God. His, His instructions for us. Let's go to our next topic. Soul winning. Again, another area of our life where you know what? Just like everything else, you should, have, you should have built into your schedule, if you care about these things, if this is your priority, to offer yourself up a living there, you should have your own schedule for coming to church. You should have your own schedule for doing your Bible reading. You should have your own schedule for doing your prayer and how much time you spend in that. And you should have your own schedule for doing, for winning souls, for talking to people, for giving the gospel to people. These should all be things that are built into your schedule if you have a priority for them. If you say, God is first in my life and He's important, these are all very basic things that the Bible goes extremely in-depth about every single one of those topics over and over and over again. It's repeated. They are very important for us to do in our Christian life. But just like everything else, even with Sony, you kind of get complacent with it where you're just like more interested in shading off a, a street on the map, just getting it done, than you are about the people you're actually talking to. When you just care, well, well, well it's time to go. Okay, yeah, well, we've been here. I, we put in an hour. We're good. We're going to go. It happens to the best of us, but try to make sure that you are keeping yourself fervent. Psalm, wherever you turn, Psalm 126. Yeah. Look at verse number 5, Psalm 126. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing issues with him. Look at the feeling involved in these verses. They that sow in tears. They're sow in tears because they care. Because you really care about other people. When you go out and you're ready to give the gospel, do you even expect people to listen and get saved? Do you have an expectation of them hearing you? Or do you say, oh, well, they're probably not going to listen. They're not going to want to listen. They're not going to want to listen. Don't have that type of an attitude. And you know what? It's funny because we get, we get proven wrong all the time. You can tell, you're like, this person, there's no way they're going to listen to me, you know. And then all of a sudden, they do. And they get saved. And praise the Lord. And the reason why we don't want to have that type of an attitude, though, is because that can cause you to not do as good of a job. When you walk into something saying, eh, this guy's not even going to listen to me, you're probably going to be a lot more likely to be real quick, oh, okay, yeah, I don't want to hear anything, okay, bye, see ya. Than actually giving them a legitimate opportunity like everyone else. Because I've noticed this before, too. You, could, you can phrase things in certain ways where you are just asking for a negative response. You wouldn't really want to listen to me give you the gospel, would you? That's just opening the door for just, just tell me no, because that's what I'm looking for right now. As opposed to something like, hey, I've got, you know, it'll only take a few, give me just a few minutes of your time. I want to share this with you because it's really important. Two different attitudes, right? right? One is, expressing concern and hey I want you to hear this and this is really important this is something you need to hear versus 
yeah, I don't really want to talk to you. But I will, if you really press the issue, I'll, I'll give you the gospel. Okay, let's, let's not have that type of an attitude. And don't fall into this routine of just having like a boring sales pitch either. Okay, well, let's turn here. Bible, Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23, you know, and just kind of go through a spiel. Just go through this, this rundown list. Now, again, I want to stress the importance of having a routine, having something familiar, having something that you fall back on, having a way of doing things so that you can preach the gospel to people. And as, especially when you get started off doing it, you know, you're, you're kind of, you got a lot of things going on, you're nervous, you need to have a structure to giving people, you, you ought to have that. You ought to know what verses you want to turn to and things like that. But don't just like get to a point where you're just like reciting, you know, just like reading off a piece of paper. Like, okay, this is how I give the gospel. And just, just read and say, okay, you know, like, what do you think? You know, we need to be conversing with people. We need to be talking to them. We need to be engaging them and caring about them enough to have that conversation. It's more than just reading. I mean, I could just get a voice recorder then and just play it for somebody, right? But that's not our job. Our job is to preach the gospel every creature, and we're supposed to go out. And it says here that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They're sowing in tears. They're, they're bearing the seed, the precious seed, the word of God, and they're going forth in tears because they know that people are going to hell. And they care about them. You should care about the people you're preaching to. And he says, you'll reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's care about those people. Look at... Uh, so if you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to read for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God so in their preaching he's saying not only did we give you the gospel he says we're willing to impart our own souls unto you that's how much they cared for the people they're preaching the gospel to how fervent is your soul winning do you care that much about the people do you care so much that you're willing to impart your own soul unto them so that they could be saved this is the attitude that the Apostle Paul had. And he says, you remember, I'm not just saying these things and just puffing myself, you remember our labor and travail. And you know what? That's the reason why it's easy to fall into a rut is because of the labor and travail. Because it's work. Because it's hard. Because it's not easy. Oftentimes we catch ourselves falling into ruts because we, we, we end up finding a way to do things just real easy and just kind of going through it and just getting it done and over with. I mean, you could do that even just in nothing, in things that aren't spiritual, just in, in work activities and stuff. When you don't care about what you're doing, you kind of just fall into a little routine of doing things just to kind of get it done and, and, and out the door, but not really caring and investing your time and energy and effort into it. All of the ways that we serve God ought to be with time and energy and effort and labor. We saw labor with praying. We saw labor here with soul winning, giving the gospel. There's labor with reading and hearing from God. There's labor in all these things. It's work. The Christian life, that's why there's hardly anybody doing it. Because it's work. But God has called us to be workers, fellow laborers, workers together for the cause of Christ and the gospel that he has laid out for us to do. He has, he has given us a title of being an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is a position where you're going to be doing some work. It's not everybody else serving you. Hey, do you want to be a minister or do you want to be ministered unto? Do you want people just coming up and just doing everything for you? Are you going to be the minister? The Bible says the greatest, you know, if you want to be great, because his disciples were kind of asking between themselves, you know, who's going to be the greatest among us? You know, all these, these disciples who did a lot. They gave up everything. They, you know, they left their families. They went on the road with Jesus. They were doing all this preaching and all this soul winning and all this stuff. And they were learning from Christ and being these examples. And they, laid it, they went off and started churches and stuff. And hey, great men of God. And they were talking among themselves, well, who's going to be greatest among us? And Jesus gave them an answer. He said, you know what? Whoever is going to be greatest among you is going to be servant of all. 
So whoever is going to be the, the humblest, meekest, lowest servant, the one who's willing to give of himself completely to help everyone else around him, that esteems others better than himself, those are going to be the people who achieve the, the best ranks, the best rewards in heaven. They're the greatest among you. Just as Jesus Christ washed the disciples' feet, just as Jesus Christ came not to have anyone do anything for him, but he came to give his life a ransom for many. He gave himself to die for our sins. Greater love hath no man than this than the man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ has, has the greatest love of all because he laid down his life for everybody. Amen. And that is, that is the type of attitude and selflessness that we need to have in order to be serving God appropriately. So with all of these different things where we could become complacent and just go through the motions, we need to make sure that our heart is right. Our heart. That we don't get kind of hardened and, and, and fall into that type of a run. How does your Christianity look today? How is your personal spiritual life? Ask yourself that. Look and, and analyze your own life. We need to get our heart into the work. We need to get our heart into this church. We need to get our heart into serving God and to, and to being a minister unto other people. The Bible says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. We should be working for God and do it heartily from our heart. Did I have you turn to 1 Peter 4? Are you in 1 Peter 4? Because this is where charity comes in. And, I, and we just recently, a few weeks ago, in our Wednesday night series, went over 1 Corinthians 13, an entire chapter dedicated to, to the concept and the thought of charity and how important charity is in our life. And charity is a, is a caring for other people. It's a love that you have in your heart. It's a motivation for doing things for other people. It's that special love that is charity. 1 Peter 4, verse 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And he gives us an example here of having charity. He says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. You can have hospitality towards people, but if you're doing it grudgingly and irritated and everything else, you don't have charity. And he said, we need above all things, we need to have fervent charity. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, though I give all of my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You could give up, you could, you could give up everything that you have to feed people who are in need. But if you're doing it because you just feel like you have to and you do, you know, it's, it's the mo charity is the motivation behind what you're doing. And charity is very important to have. If you're going to be hospital, you say, well, I have to be hospital, so I guess I'm just going to do this. You have no charity. We need to have the charity, a fervent, a fervent, not just have charity, have a fervent charity among yourselves. We ought to be caring about that and loving them enough to be like, what can I do for you? You don't even have to ask, what can I do for you? And, just, and in having that, that willingness to help other people out and to put other people first instead of looking at it as a burden. Oh, I got it. Got to do this. Didn't really want to do that, but I guess I will because, you know, the Bible says I got to be hospitable. I got to, you know. Let's not have that attitude. Now look, you should do it <laughs> either way. But let's get our hearts right and get our hearts just as much as you should come to church, but you know, don't let it feel like a drudgery. But just because it may feel like a drudgery sometimes, don't just say, well, I'm just not even going to go then. Because that's even worse. Now you're just adding sin unto sin. You don't just say, well, I'm not going to do anything then because I don't have the charity. Well, I'm not going to help people. You know, no. Keep doing what you're doing, but then work on getting your heart right. right? Keep going through the motions. It's better, it's better to go through the motions than not do it at all. But let's not go through the motions. Let's have our heart involved in what we're doing. In uh, 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, you don't have to turn it. Turn if you would to last place. Well, no. Oh, wow. I got a whole other page of notes. Wow. Lucky you. <laughs> turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Oh, we're doing pretty good on time, though. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read for you 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. This is Samuel's response to King Saul when King Saul wanted to offer up a sacrifice. He's like, I was waiting for you, Samuel. You weren't here and I just had to do this myself and everything else. And that wasn't Saul's position. It wasn't what you're supposed to be doing. He disobeyed God. He disobeyed the commandments because he just said, well, I had to do this. 
Samuel said in verse uh, 22 of 1 Samuel 15, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God doesn't care about your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. He doesn't care about those things as much as he wants you just to love him and to keep his commandments and to be able to just rely on him and have faith in him. That's what he's asking for. He wants your obedience. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how we show our love to God. You say, I love God this morning. Then keep his commandments because that's how you're going to show your love. Love is more than just a feeling you have in your heart. It's easy to have that feeling, but you want to show that love. You want to act on that love. Just like when the Bible says in James 2, faith without works is dead. You say, I have great faith in God. But if you're not acting on it, if you're not doing anything on it, then, then your faith is dead. So I got faith in God. Well, if you act in no way according to your faith, your faith is dead. We want a lively faith. We want a lively hope because that's what we do have. And we need to be acting on it. Our actions ought to show that. And our heart needs to be in it. 2 Corinthians chapter 14. One of the ways we can, we can keep our heart in it is being focused on other people and their benefit and even your own heavenly prize that you're going to attain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good goal. It's a good motivating factor to kind of stay in it and, and just know that what you're doing isn't in vain. It isn't for nothing. So when you serve God, you know, when you fall into the rut, a lot of times it's just because, oh, well, whatever. You know, at work, for example, people could fall into these ruts of not really caring that much because they're not getting paid very well. They're not getting, you know, they never get raises. And then they just stop caring about their work because they feel like, well, there's no, nothing in it for me, right? Don't feel that way with God because God has a great recompense of reward. God will reward you greatly. See, the problem is though you just have to do all the work first. He's not going to give it to you in advance. He's not going to front you the rewards. He says, no, 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 do the work. But when you do the work, we know that I have not seen nor ear heard now, heart conceive what God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. That's what the Bible says, that, that we don't even know how great it is. We, 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 we don't have any understanding right now of how great it's going to be when we get to heaven and the great rewards that God will have for those that love him. And we could just, if, hey, if you have faith, let's act on it. And that's why he doesn't tell you, I think, all the specifics of the rewards because he says, no, believe me. Yeah. Just believe me. Right. Do the work. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy. I know, I know it's going to be sleepless nights. I know there's going to be a lot of things that you have to go through. You're going to be persecuted. Just do it. Trust me. Trust me. You will like it in the end. That's what God's saying to us. And we need to have that faith. We say, you know what? I believe God. He's never let me down before. I've staked my entire soul on His Son, Jesus Christ, for me to get to heaven. I think I, think I could have the faith to just do and know that He will reward me. And you know what? That can help keep your heart in it too. Just knowing that, you know, all this work and all the stuff that you're going through, the more you care about it, the, the better you're going to do and the more God's going to reward you for it. Look at uh, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. So this is Apostle Paul. Can we kind of jumped halfway through this, this chapter, but he's saying all things are for your sakes, talking to the Corinthians. All the, all the things they do, he says, they're for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man per perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We need that renewing day by day. He's saying... We don't faint in our work. We don't just fall over and just quit. We don't stop. He says, even though our outward man, our flesh, even though that perishes, even though we're getting beaten and, and rebuked and whatever and, and persecuted, the inward man's renewed day by day. And the inward man's will give you that drive to keep going, to keep moving forward, to keep doing the work for the Lord. Because the inward man can accomplish so much and overcome that outward man. It's amazing what your mind and your heart can drive you to do and push you to do when you're doing work. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And look, you think of all the things the Apostle Paul went through and he has the attitude and the heart to say, you know what, it's a light affliction. It's not even that bad. We look at that and be like, man, I'm glad that's not happening to me because that's horrible. 
That's terrible. He says, our light affliction. It's a proper attitude. It's a right way to think about it. He says, this is just for a moment. Yeah, we're going through some hard times now. It's a light affliction. It's just for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He says, this little, this little tribulation we're going through right now, this little light affliction, it's going to be recompensed so much greater when we get to heaven. He says, it is far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He said, all the things in this life, that's just temporary. They're just going to come and go. But we've got our mind set on the things that are eternal. We've got our heart set on those things. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You're in chapter 4, so just go a few pages to the right to chapter 7. When the Corinthians were rebuked for their sins in 1 Corinthians, and remember, we went through that whole entire book in our last Bible study on Wednesday nights, and there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of rebuking going on from the Apostle Paul to their church, the things they had to get right within the church. When they got that epistle, and they read it for the whole church, they were rebuked for these sins they were guilty of. You know what didn't happen? They didn't get all upset and just quit the church and just shut down the, the church of Corinth. They didn't do that. It actually lit a fire under them and they got right with God. They received the rebuke from the Apostle Paul and they got things right. Now, they didn't get things right perfectly, but we're going to see here verse number 8. The Bible says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He's saying, look, I made you sorrowful. I made you sorry with that last letter. He says, but I don't repent. I'm not, I'm not changing my mind about writing, that, about writing that letter. He says, though I did, I think at first he's kind of thinking, like, man, this might be kind of harsh. right? Maybe, I, maybe I'm going a little bit too hard on him. But then, he's, then he changes his mind. He says, you know what? No, I didn't go too hard on him. They needed to hear this. Verse 9, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry. He says, now I'm extremely happy. I'm rejoicing. Not because I made you feel bad, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. He's saying, I'm not happy that I made you feel bad. I'm happy that I made you feel bad so that you changed and repented and got right with God. Because you had a godly sorrow. And you know what? We all ought to have that godly sorrow. When you realize, when you hear something preached, when you see God's word, he says, you know what? You ought not to be doing this. Man, oh man, I'm doing that. I'm sorry. I feel sorry. I feel bad. You know, I shouldn't be doing this, God, but I am doing it. But don't just stop with feeling sorry. Have a godly sorrow that works repentance where you say, you know what, God? I'm really sorry about that, but I'm going to change. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going I'm to get that sin out of my life. I'm going to change my life and do what's right. That's the great godly sorrow that we should be rejoicing over. And that's the attitude that we need to have. If you know there's something wrong with your own spiritual life and you feel like you're being rebuked, even today in some of the things that we're going over, have this same attitude that they did at the church of Corinth and repent. Just change what needs to be changed. Don't let it get you down and out. Let it get you down and up and better and, and improved. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance and salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He's saying after their, their, their hearing and that rebuke and their godly sorrow that worked repentance, now they're on fire. He says, yeah, look what it did to you now. You've got this, this vehement desire. You've got this zeal. Now you're back on the saddle serving God and doing what's right. Sometimes we all need that kick in the pants from God's word. We all need a little rebuking here and there. But the goal is then to give us that vehement desire. Let's not fall into the rut. Let's have a vehement desire. Let's have a zeal. For we are now on fire to serve God. Let's do this. 
It says, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, verse 12, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. And this is my, one, I think my last point that I wanted to make. Let me make sure how many more pages I got going on here, but <laughs> we've got one more page. And this is important. We all need to make sure on our own that we're not falling into these ruts, right? I mean, we have our own responsibility to God. We have our own responsibility of our own hearts to put our priorities first, to, to put Him first, to do the things in our life that we need to do. But let's also help others get excited. Let's help others be refreshed, as it were here, where it says that Titus, his spirit was refreshed by you all. That gave Titus a, a, a benefit to go and see the Corinthians and how much they've changed and all this, you know, the great work that they're doing for the Lord. I'm energized this morning. I'm energized. I've been energized this week ever since the Seglatis family came and we thank you guys for, for moving out here and coming and be a part of our church because it's exciting to be around other people that have a fervent desire to serve God. It's exciting. It rubs off on other people. It gets you energized. It gets you more fervent. So when I might be feeling like, well, I'm just kind of in a rut, then you get the, the, you know, the, the, the work of the other saints and other people get on fire for God. And, and you get a family that, that decides to make a move on faith and make, take action Look, you hear all the time about people that will move across country because they get this great, well-paying job. You hear about that type of thing. And you know what? That's not weird to the world. But it's rare when you find someone who says, you know what? There's, there's not, we're not being spiritual fed. We're not able to serve God to our utmost potential. We don't feel like we're offering ourselves up completely as a living sacrifice because there's no really good congregations for us to get around and to, and to be inspired and to serve God completely. And we feel that this is extremely important. So you know what? We're going to pick up and we're going to move. We're going to get out of our comfort zone. We've got a nice house. We've got family. We've got everything settled down and everything's nice and easy and we can keep going from day to day. And you know what? That would be easy. But we're going to make things difficult. We're going to make things very uncomfortable for ourselves because we want to push even higher. And you know what? That is exciting. And that's what's going on here. Praise the Lord for that. Let's all get excited and serve God with that same type of an attitude. Well, we're going to have faith and say, you know what? I don't know how things are going to work out. I know Prescott Valley doesn't have a very good, that good job market. Okay? It's not that easy to get work out here. You, you know what? We're just going to decide to move anyways. We're going to do it. We're going to serve God. We're going to go to a church that is on fire for serving God. We're going to go where we could hear the word preached and not be held back. And we're going to go where we could be around an entire church family and group of people that love God and want to serve Him the way that we want to serve Him. That is acting on faith. And you know what? That is energizing. I love hearing from people all the time. We get visitors that come through. Man, it's refreshing. It's even refreshing when you go out soul winning and you just run into one person who's already saved. You could be having the worst day in the world, so no one wants to listen to you. Everyone's berating you. Everyone's giving you a hard time. And it can wear you down until we get to the point where it's like, well, I've got to finish the street. It happens. It happens. And then you run into that one person that's a saint, that's sanctified because they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, you're refreshed. Let's get that fervent desire and spirit so we can help others. Let's grow off each other. Let's edify each other here in this church. Man, I love hearing about, I hear from time to time from, you know, Wayne, even though he hasn't been here in a long time, I hear about him every once in a while, you know, sharing the gospel with someone or, or talking about biblical things, giving out DVDs and doing this stuff. Hey, praise the Lord for that. You know, it makes me energized to hear that people are out doing this on their own. I hear about people, hey, I was talking to my friend and, you know, Praise the Lord. That's great. Let's keep doing that and keep bringing up those great success stories and just, just the work that you're doing because it's edifying to everybody. It's edifying and it's energizing. We need to not just be going through the motions here. If we go through the motions, we're just going to... We're not going to grow. We're not going to do anything. I mean, we're going to keep being here. And you know what? So many people that, that go through the motions, they go through the motions and they don't go out soul winning. And they don't, they don't preach the gospel to anybody. They don't, they don't take it upon themselves. So it's like your whole Christian life is 
Well, I got the sin of my life. Check. Very good. And praise the Lord for that. I'm going to church. Check. Okay, I'm reading my Bible. Check. But if you're not doing anything to help other people out and to bring and, and, and to share the truth with other people, what are you really doing with your life? I mean, that's great that you get yourself to a good point. But I, is, is the goal of the Christian life just to put yourself on a pedestal and say, look how neat and shiny and clean I am? Or is it to reach out and help other people and say, hey, come with me. I'm going to heaven, man. This is exciting. God's got all kinds of great things prepared for me. Come with. Amen. Jesus Christ died for it's free. It's a free gift. Come on and take it. Let's go. Let's get as many people as we can. We're going to heaven. Amen. Christ has conquered the devil. He's conquered death and hell. It's a victory. Let's go. He's got a party for us waiting. That's the excitement we need to have. That's the fervency we need to have. It's going to come with faith. Jesus Christ said, if you remember his stories, and I, I, won't, I won't read them all for you, but um, he says, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say unto this mountain, be removed. And he says, it's going to do it. That's the type of power you could have to remove mountains. I mean, think of, we have mountains all around us. There's no way you could do anything with that. I mean, you're not going to be able to move that. He says, if you got faith, because God's got the power, you don't have the power, God does. If you have the faith, you can remove mountains. And even in his ministry, when he went back to, to his hometown where people didn't believe on him because they knew, oh, this is just Jesus. Oh, isn't this the carpenter's son? Oh, don't we know his, his, his brethren and his sisters? And, you know, don't, don't we know his whole family? Like, who is this guy? We know this guy. He's nothing special. The Bible says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So he didn't do, he didn't do, he didn't do very much there. If you're in a church where people don't have a great vision, they don't have a great faith and belief that God's going to really do anything. If you get into this attitude of, well, we're in the end times. Everything's just going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing we could do about it. Guess what? Jesus is not going to do very many mighty works for you there. Because you don't have the faith. Even in these last days, you know, the Bible says that they're going to do great exploits in the end times. And, and, and I believe that we're in those times. I believe it's going to happen within my lifetime. I don't know it for a fact, but that's what it looks like. And there's going to be great exploits. Hey, let's have that faith of God. Let's be one of the churches that God is using to do great exploits. How exciting is that? Let's get excited. Yo, who cares what the world, who cares if the world thinks you're weird? God's called us out to be a peculiar people anyways. Right. He's the one that said, you're going to be different. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't worry if they look at you and say, oh man, your badge is nuts. He's crazy. He's lunatic. He's extremist. I am an extremist. It's all about the truth. I love the truth. I love God's word. I love every single last line that's written in this book. You want to label me extremist for that? Fine. I don't care. Because it is extremely different than the world. But don't let that get you down. Don't let, don't let those people bother you. We, we've got it all written right here. Let's stop going through the motions of the Christianity. Let's get it into our heart. We need to care about seeing people in church. We need to care about going out and pre preaching the gospel to people out soul winning. We need to set our times to, to read the Bible, to understand it, not just to skim over it. We need to set apart time to preach the gospel. We need to think about the reality of hell and of all the souls that are going there. We need to love those people. We need to think about Christ's last commandment to go out and, and, and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's go out and turn the world upside down with the doctrine, just like they did in the book of Acts. Amen. Hey, we, have this, we serve the same God today that was around back in Jesus Christ's time. That's right. He is the same God. He is able to do the same work, the same everything. Let's, let's be those people. Let, let's, let's show ourselves people that want to serve the Lord with a fervent spirit and a fervent heart and say, God... I know you can do great works. Use us. We're here. We want to do it. And you know what? Not only that, we believe that you can do it, God. We've got the faith. We've got the faith that we're willing to move and do whatever it takes to serve you, dear Lord. We're willing to come to a really small church where a lot of people might think, oh yeah, they're not going to survive another year. Yeah, yes, we are. Amen. You better, I don't care. I don't care if we have three people sitting in this room. And we don't. we got a lot more than three people in this room. We're not going anywhere. 
We may have a small group right now, but it's a solid group. Because I know for a fact I'm surrounded by everybody that loves God and that wants to do what's right. We're in, I, I don't know about you, but I am extremely energized. Amen. I can't wait for soul winning in two hours from now. That's right. Let's go out. Let's win some souls to Christ. Let's do the work that God has for us and not look back. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, help us not to get stuck in a rut and just to be going through the motions in our spiritual life, dear Lord. Help us to continually be renewed in our mind, to be reinvigorated, dear Lord. Help us to, to be a blessing unto others also, dear Lord, so that other people that might be going through these, these ruts and kind of going through the motions, that we can be a blessing to them and, and bring a, a comfort and a joy on the things that we're doing for you and how we're serving you, dear Lord, and that we can, we can do that for other people. Help us to have this mind that we want to serve you. We want to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice unto you, which is our reasonable service. And Lord, help us to make our priorities reflect that and, and that we would have the strength to do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.